I'm going to be sharing what I believe is a word from the Lord. And I know every word we preach is from the Lord. Uh, but I believe it's a prophetic word um, that the Lord wants to speak to somebody's heart and somebody's spirit today. And uh, I want you to hear it with your spiritual ears. And so we'll do it differently. But I want you to listen because I think the Lord will speak to someone today with these, with these literally just two points uh, that I'm going to share with you. The passage that I've chosen to preach on, um, it, it, it's odd, uh, considering that this time of year, uh, we generally preach something relating to the birth of Christ. Um, but I, I believe that by the end of the message, you would realize that it's a relevant word for the season that you are living in. And the passage comes from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, uh, verses 7 to 10. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I believe this word is very relevant, germane, uh, apropos, um, because I think if most of us are honest, we need out of some situation okay yes. and the topic is hope on help is on the way Amen. hope on help is on the way um, I have a number of things that just bothers me because I'm human and I don't pretend to not be and so I own the things that bothers me in order to be an effective human being. I don't pray some of them away. Before I pray them away, I own them so that I can be a better human being. And one of my biggest pet peeves is waiting. I find waiting to be one of the most frustrating experiences in life. Don't, don't look at me with that tone of judgment <laughs> because some of you don't like to wait either. Now, now you may have learned to live with it, but that's your issue. Like I said, I own my feelings. And, and, and you know, don't judge me too harshly because we live in this technologically advanced generation where everything is instant. And you, you never got frustrated at the microwave? Now, 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 I mean, you grew up heating up stuff on what they call the coal pot. You had to burn the wood, get the wood, light the wood, fan the wood. Then you could eat. Now you're frustrated at a microwave. And it's because of this age that we live in where everything is on demand. You push a button. I mean, the other day I saw this machine. You want dessert? You just go push a button and you get a cake. You go to read them all. It's right there. It's interesting. And, and, and few of us enjoy waiting. You see, waiting is one of my pet peeves because I have learned that time is one of life's most precious commodities. But, but, but here's what I'm saying, beloved. I declare to you that waiting, though, is not so bad when I know when the wait will be over. I don't, I don't like waiting, but, but it's not so bad when I know when it'll be over. If I go to the passport office, it's a long wait, but it's not so bad because you, well, you don't get the little ticket anymore, but you know the number on the thing? And then you know, you're watching, okay, number one, you're number 15, so you, so you know 14 more persons, and it'd be over. It's, it's not so bad when, you, when, when, when you're waiting, uh, uh, and, and you know, well, my birthday is coming, and it's like three months and, you know, or four months, and it'll be here. Um... um but it's hard to be waiting 
when you don't know when he or she will show up. Have you ever found yourself in a waiting room and somebody keeps telling you, he'll see you soon. He'll be out soon. And after a while, you want to say, please, stop. <laughs> you, you get tired of hearing, the doctor will see you soon. And somehow soon just never seem to come. Waiting can be frustrating because whilst waiting, all we want to hear is now. All we want to hear is, there you go. It's your turn. Well, in, in some ways, I believe that that is the context of Advent. Advent reminds us that there are people who have been waiting for generations for the Lord to make good on his promise to one day send the Son of Man. By the time we get to the birth of Christ, the people of Israel had been waiting for generations after generations after generations for the coming of the Messiah. They were waiting for the one who would restore and redeem Israel to its prominence and proper place. They had been waiting for the Lord to show up and to do what God said he was going to do. They had been waiting for centuries. And we come literally four weeks and we just light a candle and boom, it's right here. But imagine people were waiting for centuries. Folks died and never saw what they were waiting for. They had been waiting for so long that they became frustrated with all the prophets that the Lord had sent. They were waited, they, they waited for so long that they grew tired of people telling them that the Lord is on his way. Now, I don't know how you read the Bible, but when I read it, I get the impression that they grew tired of Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel and, 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 and Hosea and, 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 and Joel and, and, and Amos and, and who else? Obadiah. They grew tired of Jonah and, 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 and Micah and Nahum and, and, and come on, somebody help me. Yeah. Habakkuk and, and Zephaniah, Haggai. Haggai, Zachariah, Malachi. I mean, they had reached a point where they were tired of hearing someone say the Lord is on his way after all they just wanted him to show up and so even as I was making fun of, of it before the the banter between you know Nat and, and us and you know sometimes it's hard to to wait for Christmas and so we do Christmas some people do Christmas in Advent because because we don't like waiting we want that joyful feeling. We, we want it now. We don't want to take time to prepare to really have the joy. And, and, and I think that there's a lesson that we can take away from the season of Advent. And that is that waiting on God is an inescapable reality for every believer. I submit to you that Advent is not just a season that we enter before Christmas, but even in our daily living, Advent is a season that we enter in time and time again. Advent is any time you find yourself waiting on God to do what you know God ought to be doing in your life. From time to time, you'll find yourself waiting on God to answer a prayer. From time to time, you'll find yourself waiting on God to open a door or heal a disease or reconcile a relationship or make a way or send a spouse or bring back a prodigal child. Oftentimes in life, you'll find yourself waiting for God to do what you need him to do. Sometimes you find yourself in Advent in the middle of January. Sometimes you can be in Advent in the middle of summer. Sometimes you'll come to church and, or, or you'll wake up every day and the only question in your heart is, when God? When will you show up and do what needs to be done? Well, I'm sure by now you figured out that God operates in a much different time frame than you and I. You see, we operate in chronos. That's where you get words like chronology. Kronos is marked and measured by the rising and the setting of the sun. Or the turning of the page on the calendar. Or the buttons on the watch. That's Kronos time. But God does not operate in Kronos. God operates in Kairos. Kronos is measured in time we can mark. Kairos is, measured, is not measured by the rising or the setting of the sun. Kairos is measured by readiness. Are you with me? Kronos, the rising and setting of the sun. And Kronos and Kairos are like, uh, let me give you a best example. 
I was going to give you an example of making a roast beef, but I'm competing with Sister Ophelia because she's the baker. I cook. And what I have learned is we can see a difference. We can understand Kronos and Kairos from someone who knows how to bake and someone who follows the recipe. Because I'm learning how to bake, I got to follow the recipe. But Sister Ophelia bakes. She don't follow the recipe. And so imagine you're getting ready to make your fruit cake or Christmas cake. And, 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 and you don't know how to make it. So you get a book where the recipe uh, tells you what to do, gives you all the ingredients, tells you what temperature to set the oven at. It'll tell you how long it'll take to bake the cake. And since you don't know how to cook, all you have is a recipe. So what do you do? You set the timer just like the book said. And, and, and you do all the ingredients just like the book said. And, and, and you set it to the time that you're supposed to take the cake out. The timer goes off. And because you don't know how to cook, you pull it out. Because the timer went off. But oftentimes you find out that even though the timer went off, the cake is not ready or the cake is overdone but you don't know how to determine when it's ready because you don't know how to bake but somebody who knows how to bake oh they don't set a timer on the oven they've done it so often that they know how to look at the cake my grandmother was like that just oh it's ready how do you know it's like people ask me oh what, what what's the recipe i don't know i just a little bit of salt a little bit of black pepper you, 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 you just, it's like somebody who knows how to do it. I mean, they, they just know. They just know how to look at the cake and say, it's ready. Just one touch and they know it's ready. As a matter of fact, even the smell. Oh, yeah, the cake is five more minutes. They, they don't need a timer to let them know that it's ready. They'll pull it out when all the signs are there that it's ready to come out. I'm trying to help you with the waiting problem. Because that's what you get when you're dealing with God. God does not set an alarm on your life. God doesn't highlight a day on the calendar. God doesn't push a button to make things happen in your life. God looks at the scope of your life and determines when you are ready. And that's when he moves. In the area that you need him to move. Beloved, that's hard because oftentimes we focus so much on getting there that we miss the preparation. The problem is you miss the, if you don't if you're not prepared, you won't walk into what God has for you. So it's not that God is causing the delay you are because you won't allow preparation. So you've been praying for a spouse for so long, God says, No problem, let's prepare you. You've been praying about a financial breakthrough, God says, No problem, let's prepare you for how to live after the breakthrough. But all you want is just a breakthrough. And so when we think of that, it begs the question, how can we tell when God is ready to move in our lives? I think that this message is prophetic and significant because I believe, now, now, now there are some of you that, that you, this, this is where the sermon ends for you. You know that the thing you've been praying for, you have not been allowing the Lord to prepare you. So the sermon ends right here where you say, Lord, prepare me. But there are some of us, and I believe most of us, beloved, we have been prepared. And I believe that there are some of us that we are on the verge of a breakthrough. And the hope today is to challenge your faith to step into the breakthrough. And I believe that we can learn some things. This is where the passage is critical in helping us to understand how is it, how can we tell when God is ready to move like i said this passage is not connected to the christmas story but i submit to you you can check it for yourself i believe it's the very first passage in the bible where the lord declares he's on his way i have come down to rescue them and the passage can be summarized like god saying i'm about to show up 
I'm about to fulfill my promise. This is what I'm declaring to you today. Is there enough faith in this building? Is there enough faith online to believe this declaration with me that God is saying, I'm about to show up. I'm about to fulfill my promise. Does anybody believe him today? I'm about to do what I said I'm going to do now is the time of deliverance for somebody. Put it in the context. You know the context of Exodus. The children of Israel have been in bondage for over 400 years. And here in chapter 3, the Lord shows up and declares to Moses, after 400 years, I am about to show up. Some of you, God is about to show up and give to you promises that have been made to your generations. You are about to receive generational inheritance in Jesus' name. They've been waiting on him. They've been anticipating his coming. They've been asking and desiring for him to bring them out of bondage. And the Lord says, now I am ready to make my appearance. Now I'm going to move through the mighty waters of the Red Sea. Now I'm going to move. I'm going to turn the heart of Pharaoh. I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. That the enemy, the giant, the impossibility, the wall, the mountain that you see, God says, I've got that under control. I can part the Red Sea. The person that you think was standing in your way, God says, their heart is in my hand. He says, I'm going to lead you across the dry land. I'm going to lead you out of your oppression. Why now? After 400 years, what makes the Lord say, now I am ready? After 400 years, what is the contextual situation that makes the Lord say, now is the time of deliverance? Well, I want you to get this first point. God knows what you're going through. Can I speak to your spirit today? Hello. Can I speak to your mind today? Can I speak to your emotions I wanted to give you simple points because I don't want you to forget it. Listen, somebody needs to hear this. God knows what you are going through. I imagine that, that I was the Lord. Imagine you're having an, a divine and an angelic encounter now in the person of Angel Joel. And I'm telling you, God knows what you are going through. God said to Moses that he's showing up now because he's seen the misery of his people in Egypt. God has seen your misery. God was saying that he has seen their oppression. He has seen their oppression. He, he was saying to Moses, my eyes were not closed. I want you to receive this. God says, I've been watching what's going on and I see the oppression of my people and I'm concerned about the suffering in their lives. I'm concerned about the sorrow in their heart. Here's some good news. And I believe all of us, if not most of us, are in a season where we have wondered, God, where are you? God, can you see? God, how much more pain? God, how much more hurt? God, where are you? Beloved, the Lord is saying to you today, I know what you are going through. I have seen what you are going through. So keep hope alive. Do not give up. Help is on the way. God is concerned about you in the midst of your pain in the midst of your struggle i am giving you bona fide gospel good news this morning that the lord knows what you were going through. god knows what you are going through he knows about the oppression and he knows about the anxieties and he knows about the fears and he knows about the sleepless nights and he knows about who's hurt you and he knows about the offense and he knows about the pain and he knows about the trials and he knows about the diagnosis and he knows about the people who walk out of your life he knows about the crazy and potentially demonic co-workers and those crazy children god knows everything about you god knows what you are going through he knows he knows so be hopeful 
Because the God Almighty, the creator of the universe knows everything that you are going through. And in case you still don't have hope and faith rising in you, these next few words should let faith rise in you. Because beloved, whatever God knows, God knows how to act on. Whatever God knows, God knows how to fix. Whatever God knows, God knows how to handle. Whatever God knows, He knows how to act and He knows when to act. And the passage says, I have seen the oppression. I have seen the misery of my people. And now I am saying enough. Enough. Listen, you're going to go through this week and stuff might seem to get worse. Listen, listen, just summarize this point in one word. Enough. When the pain returns, enough. When the hurt returns, enough. God knows and he says, that's enough. I believe in my spirit that the Lord is saying to some situation today, enough. He's saying to some demonic forces, enough. I hear the voice of God. I see the spirit of God lifting up a standard and saying, enough, 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 enough against your mind, enough against your peace, enough against the pain, it's enough against the torment, enough against the anxiety, enough against the burdens, enough against the struggle, enough. Because God knows when you can't take it any longer. God knows when you've reached the extent of your power. God knows how to say enough. We we serve a God who sees, but who also knows when it's enough. Why do I believe this so passionately? Because there is no way that God is looking on this earth and seeing all that is happening and not saying enough there is no way listen 10 of you sitting right here there is no way that some of the stuff you are going through that god is not saying enough the question the problem beloved is sometimes we don't believe that he really knows we don't believe when he says it's enough but you got to let your faith line up with the word of god and let enough manifest itself in your life i can preach it but you got to believe it i can tell you but you got to walk it out the lord is saying enough help is on the way Because God knows what you're going through. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands because he knows my name and he knows my every thought because he sees each tear that falls with me 
he knows my name. He knows and he knows my name. He knows my every thought and he knows my every thought, every single tear, yes, he sees each tear that falls and he hears me when I call one more time. He knows my name, he knows my name, oh yes he, and he knows my every thought, and he sees each tear that falls, and he hears me when I call. Not only does God know what you're going through, but God hears your cries for help. I, I, I didn't say God hears you, but God hears your cry for help. The passage says, I have heard them crying because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. I heard the noise they're making because of their oppression. I heard their cries. He heard their cries. He heard the expression of their pain because of the painful realities that they're going through. Can I declare to someone prophetically today that God hears your pain about the regret that you feel. God hears your cries about the guilt that you carry. God knows, but God also hears. You see, you see, because it, 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 it's one thing to, to tell God. It's another thing to cry out to God. Those of you with children, you'll know. But sometimes you got to, in a very way that's true to your personality, do some crying out before the Lord. And, and, and he says, I, I, I heard their cries. Sometimes there is something about what you're under that God wants. He allows that pain for however long to let a certain cry come out of you. Do you know that sometimes you are in a certain pain and you release a certain cry and you feel better? Yeah. It's a certain kind of pain that gets God, a certain kind of cry that gets God's attention. And it's less about God and more about you. Because God allows some things to squeeze you and press you. So you have no choice but to go down. And when you're down and you've been humbled. Now, now I don't think it's always God's ideal, but, but it's human nature. We don't learn unless it's hot. But I know there are people who in spite of all they're going through, they still raise their voices in praise and they still raise their voices in prayers. And beloved, this is this, this prophecy, this prophetic message is for you that in spite of all that you've been going through, in spite of all the pain and the hurt and the pressures and the stresses, you've still been praising, you've still been serving, you've still been praying. And God says to you on this Advent Sunday, I hear your cry and your deliverance has come. One of the things that moves God and motivates God to act is the relentless, incessant, determined and unyielding, continuous voices of people who will say, despite what I'm going through, I will still stand. Despite what I'm going through, I will still pray. Despite what I'm going through, I will still worship. Despite what I'm going through, I will still praise. When you look at the passage, it doesn't just say, I've heard their cries. Notice what he says in verse 9. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. One version says their cries have come to my ears. 
I want you to understand that he did not just hear the noise. And, and sometimes when we come to church and we say, let's pray, and, and that's all we do sometimes, there's noise, it's not a cry, it's not a genuine prayer directed directly to the Lord, but there's something about a cry to the Lord that is pointed in his direction. Lord, you say, God, where are you? Instead of God, I need you. And, and he says, I, I heard the cries that are lifted before me. Cries in the Bible, it's, it's a biblical metaphor for prayer. And the Lord said, Moses, I am coming because my people are praying. Listen, listen, listen. What is it? If my people call by my name shall humble themselves and, and turn and seek my faith. Listen, whenever we pray, something happens. It's a shameless plug for the Wednesday prayer because people who pray experience God. People who come together, join in hands with other hands and praying together in unity, corporately, we experience God. But the enemy makes it possible that we are so busy that prayer is no longer a priority. Beloved, the things that work then still works now. Prayer is still the best way to get through to God. Prayer is still the best way for a miracle. Prayer is still the best way for a breakthrough. Prayer is still the best way to strengthen. And prayer with the with others is also beneficial. But if we're honest... Prayer and the word of God is what goes when life happens. <laughs> Worship might stay because you just listen to the music. It soothes you. The prayer is harder. And, and, and God says their deliverance was guaranteed because I know what they're going through. In other words, I, they've got that assurance, the blessed assurance that I am their God. But he said that assurance came with keys that they've got to use. And one of those keys was pray. Sometimes we think more than we pray. We plan more than we pray. You got to plan and you got to think, but you must also pray. Pray and think. Pray and plan. Pray and fight. Pray and work. Am I making sense? God says, I will show up and bring deliverance because my people are lifting up my name. They're not just showing up for church. And I want to challenge you. Some of us, that's what you do. You show up for church and God knows I'm happy that you're here. But you got to do church on Monday. You got to do church on Tuesday. You got to do church on Wednesday. You got to do church on Wednesday. You got to walk this thing all, all week or else you're nothing but somebody who's a fan of Jesus. The marriage might get better. When you come to church, but by Wednesday, it's bad again. But you won't change. You got to keep praying. He says, I heard their cries. They're not just liking me, but they are desiring to be like me. And he says, when I hear my name being called upon and lifted up, that's when I show up. If you want to hasten the move of God, you got to keep praying. If you want to hasten the move of God, you got to keep crying out to him. If you want to hasten the hand of God, you've got to keep crying out to him. So let me wrap up. I believe when the Lord gives us a word, we must deliver it. And I know that there is a tendency, especially in Christmas time, to fight our issues so that we can be happy with the atmosphere, if you get what I mean. After all, it's Christmas. Nobody should be sad. The problem is, some of us are sad. There are some people who won't have family around this Christmas. They didn't make it through last year. So for some of us, Christmas is rough and life is tough. But, but, but I'm saying to you, beloved, that, that no matter what you're going through, don't give up. Hope on. Help is on the way. God knows what you're going through. And, and maybe now is the time you need to start praying like you've never prayed. You need to set aside time every day and say, God, I'm just going to keep praying. God hears your cry. So we journey towards Christmas. I could, I could preach the birth of Christ. I can preach it for 300 and for 52 weeks. But before the birth, 
there was a pregnancy. Before the birth, there was a promise. Before the birth, there were painful times. But do you know that, that one of the things I love about the Christmas story and, and the very fact of the Christmas story, and I call it Christmas not, it's simply because it's a popular word, but I prefer the word the incarnation because it's God becoming man. That's miraculous. If there's anything you ought to take away from Christmas besides the light and the beautiful uh, music and, and the family gathering, it's a miracle season. Yes, Everything, in my opinion, about Christmas is miraculous. God becoming man, that's miraculous. A, a, a virgin giving birth, to, getting pregnant, that's miraculous. A man marrying a, a, a woman who comes and says, uh, well, just so you know, I mean, I, I'm all for it marrying you but um i'm with child and the man after an encounter with an angel and so she says an angel told me and then he now has an encounter. i mean that's all miraculous and, and and these four weeks could you turn your dial up to miracle radio and say god i i want the best christmas i've ever had I, I want the best Christmas. I want the most miraculous Christmas I've ever had. I want my miracle. I don't know what your miracle is, but here's what I know. God knows what you're going through, and he hears your cries, and he's come down to pull you out of it. Your miracle might just be, God, I want to pass these exams. I don't know. Your miracle might just be, God, I want to believe in myself again. God, I want, I, I want change. Mary and Joseph had their miracle. You can have yours. Mary had a miracle she didn't know she needed. God's plan for her life involved the miraculous. Listen, some of you, if you're honest with yourself, you know God. The only way I'm going to get through is with a miracle. Elizabeth and John. You know the story. Miraculous. Simeon and Anna. They had a breakthrough. I mean, the, the shepherds, an unusual encounter. I mean, let's not even bother the wise men. Let's stand. That lay between us. Hallelujah. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours for
Jesus is our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, and our redeemer. Our souls wait for the Lord, in his word is our hope. Beloved, go now and walk in the light of the Lord. Stay alert, for the Lord is near. Live honorably in obedience and holiness. May God clothe you in the light of Christ. May Christ Jesus teach you his ways. And may the Holy Spirit keep you alert, empowered, and prepared for the coming day of the Lord. And may every blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.